Welcome to the Solid Verbal. The Solid Verbal. Come after me! I'm a man! I'm 40! I've heard so many players say, well, I want to be happy. You want to be happy for a day? Eat a steak. It's that woo woo! And now, Dan and Ty. Welcome back to the Solid Verbal, boys and girls. My name is Ty Hildenbrand. Joining me, as always, over there in beautiful New York City, my man... Dan Rubenstein, sir, how are you? You know, I got a massage earlier today, Ty. What? I, I really? slept I slept terribly the past two nights on my neck and was really feeling it. And I have one of those handheld massagers. That's on the fritz. And so I went to a, a local place that's well-reviewed, got 10 minutes of intense attention. And I got to say, I think it opened something up in me and I'm feeling great. Okay, there's a Bob Kraft joke in there that I will not make. I promise you. <laughs> Upper back massage. Will not make that joke. Welcome back to the show. I'm Ty. He's Dan. This is The Solid Verbal. Our website is solidverbal.com. If you're checking us out for the very first time, you can find everything you need on that website. If you want to listen on your app of choice, if you want to subscribe to our newsletter, which we're going to use in the next couple of weeks to announce some fun things that we've got on the horizon. Also, you can check us out on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, and there is also a subreddit at reddit.com slash r slash solid verbal. That is where some of our most loyal verballers hang out and talk about all the episodes, as well as some other popular college football topics. Dan, did I miss anything in there? No, I think that's pretty good. We've got a whole bunch of shows that if you haven't listened to these past few weeks, I think you should go check out. We've been... I think we have been hitting our stride pretty nicely, and it's not even July when we would start doing season previews, team previews, conference previews. It's, it's a no weeks off operation here, Ty, and I, I couldn't be prouder. I feel like since I started standing mm-hmm. while I record, yeah, I'm I've with not you. O- I've not only enjoyed the show more, but some of the ideas to make it through this long, <laughs> cold off season. Yeah. I've just they've come a little bit more naturally, not just to me, but to you as well. This is true. And can we first before we get into because you know what the show is generally about, because you've seen the title and description, we need to give proper attribution to our our inspiration for doing tonight's show. Yes, absolutely. So I don't know. If, have we settled on a title? Maybe we just call it all time solid verbal. Something like that. Yeah, yeah. Something along those lines. We started talking about it earlier in the week. We both gravitated towards it right Sol away. Americans? Mm, we can do I'll that. I'll keep workshopping. I'll keep workshopping. Let's workshop all throughout the next hour or so. But yeah. yes, proper attribution is required here. Do you want to lay it all out there? Yeah. So somebody who's been around the sort of Twitter sphere and college football universe online for a while is this guy, Jim Weber, and helps to put together and run and do all sorts of things with a, a concept, a website, a feed, all sorts of things called Lost Letterman. And every so often, I don't even think he doesn't know we're doing this, but every so often he says, hey, just reply to this tweet with the first random college football player you think of. And there are, I'm sure you've gone through it now, incredible responses that people are just saying like, hey, Willie Tuatama, hey, uh, Joe Schobert. <laughs> like, it's just all over the place. Incredible players that we've celebrated these past few years. But the replies to his specific tweet go back forever and ever. So we decided that we were going to come up with two sort of all-American-ish teams. Yes. And they are both going to exist within the solid verbal universe of time. So this is all-American teams that we are coming up with that is only including players that have played during which we've had a podcast. So 2008 to current day. Correct. Um, And the first team is, and I want to explain this correctly, because either way, we're going to get a lot of people pushing back and questioning some of our choices. The first team is the, it's the all solid verbal standard, all American team. It's not necessarily who we think is the actual best player at every position. This is the clear best offensive lineman at, you know, playing right tackle. It's not that, but it is the best person that also resonated most intensely with us, right? Does that make sense? I I think so. Um It's it's a combination of being best and subjectively made the biggest impact on us. So, while the subjective best quarterback is you know statistically and accomplishment it, it's probably what who baker mayfield i don't know 
That's it's 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 very subjective. But you have on this a quarterback who nobody would choose as the player that you consider to be one of the most impactful and best players. And I yeah, love that. So it's it's we've we've got two teams that we're putting together. And the second team is what, Ty? Well, so the first is right as you described. It's our collection. It's our favorites of the best. Our favorites of the best, and then we've also got another team, which is just more random. But I think guys who had <laughs> who had an impact on us. None of them. I'm looking here. None of them really had much of an NFL future. A lot of them right. had their glory very much limited to their college years as college football players. But guys that resonate with us. Not only because they're random or maybe a funny names or had an accomplishment here or there in the college game, but I thought of it pretty specifically in terms of who we talked about over the course yeah. of the last decade sure. or so. Uh, you can see a little bit where that's going if you've listened to us for a while, because some of these names are going to sound familiar and you'll know some of the obvious hooks into our show dating back, gosh, years and years and years now, but... So one team is sort of like our all-American team, the players that had the most impact on us over the last 12 years or so, however long it's been since 2008 mm-hmm. now. And then the second team is more just a bunch of randos, maybe not NFL accomplished, maybe not even that college accomplished, but guys who had an impact <laughs> on us both in terms of the show and just as college football fans. Would you say they have sentimental value? Absolutely. These are players that have sent them. I think we have three times as many Illini as we do Alabama players. <laughs> I want to start with teams. the random team first. Yeah. So these are just to all the players we liked before. Okay. Is That's the song. Daniel. Hit me. Let's start out at the quarterback position. So this is just sentimental favorites, not necessarily excellence. Let's talk a little bit about my boy casual dress, James Franklin. Oh, my gosh. Great pick. Casual dress, James Franklin. Anyone here remember him? Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Casual dress, James Franklin. He was quarterback for four years for the Missouri Tigers under Gary Pinkle. He was quarterback, I believe, at the time that, yeah, that would be the time when they converted over from the Big 12 to the SEC. Mm-hmm. And we were doing the show then. It was 2010 through 2013. And I was enamored with this guy, not because his stats were off the charts. I'm looking at him now. Believe me, they were not off the charts. He was fine. He was fine. Yeah, he was a fine college quarterback. But what had me so enamored about James Franklin was the fact that he would drop back in the pocket. Mm -hmm. And you, if you weren't listening to the game, if you didn't have the sound up to hear that there was actual hitting going on. You would have thought that they blew the whistle. Yeah. He was always very nonchalant in the pocket, standing upright, walking around back there at times. Casual dress James Franklin was born on the show. Uh, Very different person. Does not the current coach of Penn State, but casual dress James Franklin, 6,900 yards in his career. Four years. Nice. At Mizzou. Casual yeah, he, so I got to the bottom of this a little bit accidentally because I think the offensive coordinator at this time for Mizzou was Dave Christensen, who, excuse me, I don't know, not Dave Christensen. What was it's the floppy haired guy who ended up at Oregon under Mark Helfrich. Um, but Dave Christensen was at Mizzou at this time. And this quarterback coach, I'm finding his name as we do it as we're doing this was Mark Helfrich's offensive coordinator uh, his final year. And so Dakota Prukop also <laughs> had this very flat-footed um, a, a approach to playing quarterback because he got benched after like three games. But um, it was as if James Franklin got out of his car in a shopping center, hungry for lunch, and there's Panera on one side and Chick-fil-A on the other. And he's just sort of scanning. It's like, what do I feel? It was an extremely passive pocket. What is it um, that appeals to me about Denario Alexander, TJ Moe, or any of these guys? So um, I I, I, I applaud that pick. Any other quarterbacks that you sort of considered for your team? I have multiple options here. I won't go into them with such detail, but Tate Forcier Mm. has to be on this list here. David Yost is the floppy-haired guy, by David the way. Yost, okay, right. I think he's the current offensive coordinator at Texas Tech, so look forward to that, Red Raiders. Tate Forcier had 2,000 passing yards as a freshman back in 2009, right when we were, yeah. I guess, in our second year of doing the podcast. And I remember him well, a lot of people remember him well, for beating Notre Dame 
on a late touchdown pass that season. Of course, someone else. He had a run else, up the gut, right, against Notre Dame? He For had a touchdown, a, like a had, long. He had a run, I believe, but it was a touchdown pass late in the game that, that ended oh, yeah, up yeah. winning it. He was supplanted by someone else who I believe is on your side of the equation yeah. here, which we'll talk about. But Tate Forsey had a bit of an edge to him, seemed very dynamic as a freshman, and then sort of fell off the face of the earth. Transferred a few times, yeah. The other guys I have here are Joel Stave, mm. who is forever in solid verbal lore, played 44 games for Wisconsin but will be forever known, at least in in the context of our show, for developing the yips back in 2014. Poor guy. Developed Poor. the yips. He was fine. Nothing great. Um, but that really did resonate with you. So I have Denard Robinson because I went back recently randomly and in thinking in my brain, I want to remember how good Denard Robinson. Am I misremembering that Denard Robinson was super fun? And I did not misremember him because he he was amazing. I'm sure Michigan fans have sort of mixed feelings that are not probably totally his fault because of the coaching change of going from Rich Rodriguez to Brady Hoke and the Al Borges offense and the complications from there. And he ends up as sort of an all-purpose weapon before getting drafted. But damn, was he fun. And I I would imagine... The the biggest compliment that you could pay somebody, no matter their position, no matter what team they're on, he probably made a lot of BH's clench tie. And I'm sure yours was one of them when Michigan played Notre Dame. That at any moment, he was just going to rip off a 71-yard run. You never knew. And you go back and watch the highlights, because I think it was the Under the Lights game with the big M, the yeah. big block oh, yeah. M jersey. Sure. He went crazy. He, they were throwing RPOs pretty early on. It was a crazy fun Michigan team, at least on offense. And I would imagine Michigan fans now who are like, we need to modernize this offense. You just show them the <laughs> clips of like the 2010, 2011, whatever Michigan team. Like, oh, that'd be great. That'd be pretty cool. Collectively so. between passing yardage and rushing slash receiving yardage. Yeah. He had over 10,000 total yards. He's the best dual threat quarterback in Big Ten history. Just incredible. And you're right. Yeah. Every time he touched the ball, there was always that risk mm-hmm. that he was going to break one and score. Really <sighs> a great example of how one player in the college game can truly overtake overtake an opponent. He was yeah. incredible. You had to account for him at all times. So I am thrilled. Denard's a good pick here, but... I'm um, thrilled, by the way, that Don Pelham never coached against him on like generating a third and 17 against Denard Robinson. That is one of the great successes of my Oregon fan. Right. I'm never having to see that. Other quarterbacks with sentimental value to you. Yeah, I got Jimmy Heisman, obviously, Jimmy Clausen, who I forgot about. So 2009, he had a really good year when they went six and six, right? Yeah. He was very good. That was a Golden Tate, Michael Floyd team. Yep. Yep. I believe um, his 2008, the year before, he had two of the absolute stinkerest games <laughs> I've ever seen. The Boston College game and the USC game. I think he combined to throw six or seven picks. The USC game was just abominable. And the fact that he came back the next year and was really good with a pretty bad team. I admire that. And I that if you look at my list, there are a lot of players who thrive despite things out of their control going terribly wrong. Yeah. And Jimmy Clausen, for all the crap he took finished his Notre Dame career in a pretty pretty fun way. I would agree. I looked at his stats recently just for the hell of it. I watched the clips. I watched the film. Yeah. He was good. He was. He was. I like the next name on your quarterback list here, though. This is a good one that I forgot about. T-Magic. <laughs> T-Magic, Taylor Martinez, who the case wow. is, pr- is pretty clear he's the best modern Nebraska quarterback. We'll see if the new Martinez is better, Adrian Martinez, but it's better than Tommy Armstrong. <laughs> I would argue better than Tanner Lee, no matter the the Manning Passing Academy success. And there was just an element, and this is just sentimental. This is not saying that he is the best quarterback. He was the best quarterback of his era. Nothing like that. I enjoyed the hell out of the best of Taylor Martinez, shot put, javelin throwing, and all. He developed into a pretty good quarterback. He helped them to win a bunch of games. And he is the subject of one of my favorite hush-hush conversations I had. I don't think this is betraying any trust. Uh, Our pal, old pal, Mike Nobler. When I visited, we did a shoot, a video shoot at Nebraska in 2012. Um, Yeah, I think it was 2012. 
he pulled me aside and like this is sort of off the record but we're going to the option next year (laughs) it's coming back (laughs) and it didn't come back like they look like in the 90s but taylor martinez when he was healthy and feeling it was super fun i think his coming out game was against kansas state and he ran for like 200 and some odd yards and there was just something pretty great about Nebraska fans out of nowhere working themselves into a frenzy over T Magic. And I celebrate that. Also goes into that same category as Denard Robinson with over 10,000 yards if you count yes. up passing and rushing slash receiving. So a very, very bright career for T Magic at, at Nebraska. I remember talking about him many times. Mm hmm. Let's move on to running back. So here, here's what's interesting about the running back position. We both have a variety of names yeah, that I think we want to talk about here. But isn't it true that we could do a full episode just talking about the running back room at USC over the years? Yeah. Guys that fall into this sentimental, like Alan Bradford, mm-hmm. uh, Mark Tyler, guys like there are so many of them. Yeah. Joe McKnight, U- rest in peace. Yeah. Right. CJ Gable. Yeah. CJ Gable. <laughs> yeah. Chauncey Washington. There are, there are three to five USC players. And the, the, the big room was like 2007. So it's just before our show started. But tangentially, if we want to go here, there are, whether it was Herschel Dennis or Desmond Reed or <laughs> Jeff Byers, guys, they were like, were you recruited in the 90s? <laughs> were you offered a scholarship via CompuServe? <laughs> oh, God. It's great. Right. Okay. So, Yes, we could do an entire show on just ridiculous rooms across college football, and that room comes from... There were 11 blue-chip players. All right. I've got Mikel LaShore. Oh, my gosh. Mikel LaShore from Illinois. There are, He's not the last Illinois player we will list. No, but, not even the second to last. No. <laughs> Mikel LaShore, he had almost 1,700 yards as a junior, and then he left early. Got mm-hmm. drafted in the second round by the Lions... Yeah, I think he was good for a couple of years. He was good for one year. Oh, okay. Got over 200 carries his first year. Very promising. Played three games the next season for a total of nine yards in, in NFL play and hmm. they never played yeah. again. Okay. But he had that one year at Illinois that really vaulted his status. Mikel what, 2010? LaShore. Yeah. Mikel LaShore, and by the way, this is a disclaimer, and this has nothing to do with Mikel LaShore, but we may name a player or four players who have gone on to do shady or horrendous things after they played college football. We did not research, so if, let's say, Joel Stave has defrauded a series of preschools or something, we did not do any research, and so we are strictly talking about sentimental value about what these players did on the field and nothing else. Some other names here, very quickly. Fitzgerald yeah. Toussaint from Michigan. Oh, Fitz. Fitz Toussaint. There was a run of Michigan receivers that you're like, oh, he's pretty good. I don't think I'm ever going to see him again, but he's pretty good. I also have Jeremy Gallon on my list. We'll talk about him in a little bit. Five foot one. Tons of fun. Yeah. Lake Seastrunk, your boy. Oh, bounce it outside. Yep. Wasn't he the one that helped get Chip Kelly in trouble? No comment, Ty. No comment. It was He didn't help, but yes, his recruitment was the subject of an investigation. And yes, Lake Seastrunk, who I still maintain one of the most underrated high school film, whatever tapes. I mean, he played in Texas and his speed was unbelievable coming out of high school. He was a five star, but... It, it seemed very shady because all sorts of schools suddenly backed off him near the end of his recruitment <laughs> and Oregon was like, well, I guess we'll take him. I yeah. don't know. That's the good stuff right there. <laughs> yeah. And then the other name here that I have on this list, and I think for my money, this is the best name, best okay. random name that we're going to talk about here. Zach Zwinak. Oh my God. I love it. Zach freaking Zwinak from Penn State. Mm-hmm. He was the guy, like the, the guy Mm -hmm. for Bill O'Brien over that very short tenure he had at Penn State when everyone was fleeing Penn State because of the scandal Mm -hmm. and they had very few scholarship players. He was one half of that vaunted Zwinak-Bill Belton combo that they're going to talk about 
I'm sure in perpetuity, rushed for, I think, a 1,000 yards or close to a 1,000 yards both seasons that he got the bulk of the carries and really, truly was the guy for Bill O'Brien for two years. That was Hack's freshman year, right? He started as a true freshman. Yes, correct. And was good. So in retrospect, Bill O'Brien, pretty good coach. <laughs> pretty good college coach. I think that class, uh, it was a smaller recruiting class, but pretty good because you were going to see playing time early on. Um, yeah, Bill Belton, Zach Zwinak. Yeah, there was something about some of that team where you're like, yeah, my cousin Zach's pretty good. If you want him to start. Well, that's what I was going to say. For sentimental yeah. value and for randoms that played college football, mm-hmm. if you want to go mining, go look at that 2012-2013 span for Penn State football. You'll find a Mike Zordich here and there. Guys like I that. Still re- yeah, I still remember a Davy Jones story after Bill O'Brien left where like Bill O'Brien called him on the phone and was like, I'm dealing with a lot here. <laughs> There's a lot. I'm, whoa. This those is were, not an easy Those were job. the Evan Schwan years at Penn State, so. Yes. Um, for running back on my just all sentimental team, my lost Letterman squad, I have Kadeem Carey, oh, who man. anchored, <laughs> who I believe did get in trouble. So I'm strictly talking about my sentimental value for what he did on the field. Um, what he did on the just such a hipster 2013 Arizona Wildcat squad with uh, BJ Denker. It was the the hipster ass West Virginia Pat White Steve Slayton backfield with Kadeem Carey and BJ Denker, who I think Kadeem Carey went for about 4,000 yards in two years. BJ Denker almost rushed for 1,000 in 2013. They beat a, a really good Oregon team that year in Tucson, and he was so good. He was arguably the best running back in the country, and he just sort of faded. I think he was drafted in, you know, a mid round to like the Bears or something, and never did anything. But both I have him and I have David Wilson, who had one extraordinary year for Virginia Tech. Oh man! And that makes me happy because I've watched recent Virginia Tech offenses, and it's nice to go back to a time where they could run the ball. <laughs> and he was a, a great all-purpose weapon, and he did backflips and. It's a little personal to me because I met him, I interviewed him, and was super nice, did a, did a really fun interview with him, and then he, I think he medically retired after like a year in the NFL. He had so something I like remembering crazy. the good times. His it was like a year. vertebrae, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. He had something yeah. crazy, like 18, 1900 yards from scrimmage. Mm-hmm. He, he was, was great. junior year, and the Giants drafted him. He, he was in the first round, yeah. He was great in college, mm-hmm. and then had the injury and wasn't able to play. So that, that still resonates with me. Okay, let's go receiver. Okay. Why don't you start with receiver? All right. So this is on my sentimental team. And th- these are the best compliments I can offer to a, especially a receiver where you're in such you're in so little control of your actual success. It's so quarterback and blocking and you know DB dependent. But the three of my guys, this is my like memorial Eric Decker award. For mm-hmm. being on not so good and just getting open and being an entire offense. AJ Jenkins for Illinois. Yeah. Another ally and I, I think his quarterback was Nathan Shieldhouse. Oh man. Um, and that he was the offense. He was that offense. Jared Aberderis, who I think early had Russell Wilson, and then it got kind of rough <laughs> quarterback for Wisconsin. <laughs> but he was alongside Nick Toon, and they were both very, very good. You could have gone underrated. Nick Toon here. Could definitely have gone Nick Toon. I went back and forth. My third pick is my favorite just in terms of sentimentality, and you know it must be because it's a receiver from Oregon State, and this is similar to my feeling of, or my comparison for you about clenching that BH yeah. with uh, Denard Robinson, James Rogers, and I know yep. Quiz gets probably more attention because of his size and just you know the, the huge game he had against USC, but James Rogers running the fly sweep and then just unguardable. There are certain receivers you look at and like if I put Julio Jones or Alshon Jeffrey or Calvin Ridley, you know, all of these guys who are just Adonis's in front of you and said, these guys are, here's a spoiler. You're not going to be able to guard them. You're like, yeah, I get that. Uh huh. <laughs> yep. I totally agree. You put James Rogers in front of you like, hey, we could figure something out. And you couldn't. James Rogers was that good and that automatic. And I loved watching him and it made me feel terrible. <laughs> Because he went to Oregon State and he would kill Oregon each year. He was so good. A good return man, too. 
Yeah, absolutely. He was terrifying. All right. Who do you have? I've got Aurelius Ben. Um, while we're doing <laughs> while Regis, we're doing, while we're doing the Illinois thing, yeah. Here's what's interesting about Aurelius Ben. I feel like a lot of people know him. A lot of people know the name, but yeah, five star. Yep. After he had a breakout sophomore year, he had like a thousand yards a sophomore year. Mm -hmm. If you look over the totality of his college career, he only had, he played three years and left early. He only had seven receiving touchdowns in three years. Okay. All right. So it wasn't like a Justin Blackman kind of season where he's got a million touchdowns, uh, seven total over the span of three years. He was drafted, I think, in the second round by the Bucs. Mm-hmm. Had Got like, hurt kind of immediately, right? Yeah, had around 1,000 yards over the entire span of his NFL career and sort of flamed out. But Aurelius right. Ben had that season. Went to the, it, it wasn't the same season that Illinois went to the Rose Bowl with Juice Williams because that was the year before we started doing our podcast in like 2007. But he had that experience. He built on that experience the next year had over a thousand yards in his sophomore year, then left early after his junior campaign got drafted and then didn't really work out. But Aurelius Ben is a name that still holds very much sentimental value for me. Also on that list, I mentioned Jeremy Gallon. We won't go back into it. He does fall into that category of Michigan receivers that you know by name, but you mm-hmm. knew in the moment that maybe we won't see them on Sundays or just fun to watch. Little Jeremy Roy Gallen. Roundtree action. Little Roy, Ra- I, I considered Roy Roundtree as well. Absolutely. I have Derrick Rogers on this list. Oh, great transfer. Uh, Derrick Rogers had some issues at Tennessee, ended up transferring to Tennessee Tech. Mm-hmm. I just like the fact that his name was Derrick. We always got a kick yeah. out of that doing the <laughs> played, show. Played at Autzen Stadium, Tennessee Tech, and then made it to the NFL for a little bit. Totally good pick. Some other names here on my list. I'm surprised you didn't include Josh Huff. You know, I didn't want to go too heavy Oregon because we've got a couple here and I don't know. You took one, maybe two Notre Dame players. I love there's Josh Huff, Jeff Mayle. There's all sorts of players on, in that those wide out cores. I'm also throwing Marvin McNutt in there. I think he might be my number one Marvin McNutt from, over DJK. Yeah. OK. Had a cup of coffee, I believe, with the NFL. Played a little bit here and there. So he was drafted in 2012. So who were his quarterbacks? At Iowa. Let's see. Who was throwing 2000, to Marvin McNutt? Because they had DJK. That was a good duo. In 2008, he had Ricky Stanzi. Oh, love it or leave it. In 2009, he had Ricky Stanzi. <laughs> yeah. In 2010, he had Ricky Stanzi. Okay, so that was, that was totally decent. That's an NFL quarterback. And in 2011, James Vandenberg. All right. So Ricky Stanzi was an NFL quarterback. All right. Before we go any further, Dan, need to talk to you about Indochino. Oh, please. Now I'm going to see you this weekend. Full disclosure. That's, I'm going to oh, see yeah. you this weekend, but we're not doing the suit thing. We got to make sure we organize a suit fitting at some point this summer at Indochino. Yes. We Indochino, have to. they make suits, they make shirts to your exact measurements which gives you an unparalleled fit, unparalleled comfort. Mm -hmm. Guys love the wide selection of high-quality fabrics and colors, not to mention the option to personalize all the details, whether it's your lapel, your lining, your pockets, your buttons, you name it. It's an easy process. All you got to do is visit a stylist at one of their 40 showrooms in North America and have them take your measurements, or Mm -hmm. you can actually do it at home and just shop online at Indochino.com. You submit your measurements, Give them your design choices. You just sit back, relax. Your suit is going to be professionally tailored. Indochino has been with us for a long time. This week, our listeners can get any premium Indochino suit for just $3.59 at Indochino.com when you enter solid at checkout. That's 50% off regular price. A made-to-measure premium suit. Shipping's free. Again, it's Indochino.com. I N D O. C H I N O dot com promo code solid. Any premium suit, three fifty nine with free shipping. A great deal, incredible deal for a premium made to measure suit. Once you go custom, you're never gonna want to go back. So that is Indochino. Use promo code solid. Dan, 
Also, if you're looking for ways to save some extra money this summer, if you want to start paying less on your credit card balances, if you want to refinance with a credit card consolidation loan, why not do it through Lightstream? Oh my God, yeah. It's an easy way you can save hundreds, maybe even thousands of dollars and lower your interest rate. Lightstream offers credit card consolidation loans from 5.95% APR with auto pay. That is far lower than the average credit card interest rate of over 19% APR. Plus, there are absolutely no fees. You can even get your money as soon as the day you apply. Lightstream believes that people with good credit deserve better loans and a better loan experience. If you are interested, if you are a listener, just for our listeners, you can apply now and get a special interest rate discount. The only way to get it, though, is to go to lightstream.com slash solid. That's L-I-G-H-T-S-T-R-E-A-M dot com slash solid. Of course, subject to credit approval. The rate includes a 0.5% auto pay discount. Terms and conditions apply and offers are subject to change without notice. Visit lightstream.com slash solid if you would like more information, Dan. That seems reasonable. All right. Let's move to the lines here. I'm ready. Are there any names with sentimental value to you along the lines? So along the offensive line, I have one name, and this is one of my Oregon names. It's Kyle Long, who, yes, he's a first-round pick. He's still in the NFL, but he was not a long-time college name. He played one year of college football. I think he started playing college baseball and got in trouble and went Juco and ended up at Oregon. He was a backup at Oregon during his one season, and into like November... And this this still resonates with me. They're like, well, he's he's come along. He's learned the playbook. He has a good understanding. And uh, I guess we're going to start him against USC <laughs> on the road at USC. Smash cut to Kenyon Barner running for 321 yards behind Kyle Long. And it made me so happy. So, 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 so. It was uh, Marcus Mariota's freshman year. And I think they petitioned to get him another year. It didn't work. And so his fallback plan was getting drafted in the first round. And Kyle Long probably would have been like a blue chip five star offensive lineman had he chosen football over baseball. He grew up in, I want to say, Charlottesville. I think that's where the Long family resides. But I remember that early on hearing just from people at Oregon practice, players and coaches and people who just happen to be like, he's a different kind of guy. <laughs> he's a different guy. So he's going to start and he's going to be the best guy that there is. And so that became really apparent that first game starting. And so I held a soft spot from, uh, from 2000, 20,000. I held a soft spot from uh, 2012. I don't have an offensive lineman, but I do have a defensive lineman. I know you disrespect large men. Remember a gentleman by the name of Jackson, Jeff Coat. What about Jeff Schwartz? I guess he was 07 was his final year. Jackson Jeff Coat, Dan. Jackson Jeff Coat. He was the number one strong side defensive end in the 2010 recruiting class. He's Canadian born. Mm -hmm. He got to be really good. He played at the University of Texas and didn't really go on to that renown of a pro career but came in with a certain amount of acclaim and uh i was always enamored with the name you know well, now like, it's the name of a billions character almost there's a character on billions named jock jeff coat and i always think of jackson jeff coat jackson jeff coat played at tennessee no jackson jeff coat played at texas mm -hmm. the name forever sticks with me this was right in the early part of our solid verbal rise to glory here on the podcast. Jackson Jeffcoat. You know what I really liked about not just Jackson Jeffcoat, but a lot of players from this Texas era? It was like the forgotten era. It oh, was yeah. oh, all time. these players seeing Vince Young and then Colt McCoy and those incredible secondaries and running backs, whoever... There's just this Texas team is just going to be a, a never ending dynasty. And then, like, it's the actual Jackson Jeffcoat era, right? It's like 2010 to 2013. That's the end of Mac Brown at Texas. Yep. That's the, well, is he going to turn around this year? No. Is he going to turn around this year? No. And, like, it's the hush hush, like, forgotten era yeah. of, of Texas. And 
I'm trying to think who else were on. God, it was. I'm looking through here. This is Jackson Shipley, Marquise Goodwin, Fozzie Whitaker. Fozzie Whitaker. Um, holy cow. You got David Ash in there until he got hurt. Um, there's, you have, I think, two Malcolm Browns, right? Yeah. <laughs> on, on both sides of the ball, you have DJ Monroe, Joe Bergeron, who like really flashed for a while, Jonathan Gray. So, Dajay Johnson. Oh my God, these names. So, this was like that forgotten era. And every team has this era. And, you know, what, whether it was like as things went downhill for Notre Dame or the end of, you know, uh, Mark Helfrich at Oregon and even the end of Pete Carroll at USC, you're like, oh yeah, that guy. Huh. Yeah. I just went to a Rose Bowl. That's it. So, I love that, that, you know, Jackson Jeff quote was still able to shine through some, some turbulent times. Let's go over to linebacker now. Yeah. Well, I didn't give my defensive lineman. Oh, please. I'll go through these quickly because I love a good, unorthodoxly, not a word, sized defensive lineman. You look at LSU and you're like, man, both of their defensive tackles are 6'5", 330. Great. Both of their ends are 6'4", 275. Exactly what you want. I love it when they're like, I, so I have listed on here every undersized defensive end from TCU ever. <laughs> Jerry Hughes, who is pre-fantasy things. Yeah. Did you know Jerry Hughes used to be a running back? <laughs> pre-fantasy things all-star if it had existed. But Stansley Mapunga, Devontae Fields, who did get into a, a, a bunch of trouble, and Paul Dawson, all these guys were like, they just look like they were like, oh, he's he's built kind of solidly. But like if he were working a construction site or at an office, they're all 6'2", 240. <laughs> and we're all amazing. They were all incredible. I also have down here unorthodoxly sized Mount Cody yeah. for Alabama, yeah. who blocked a game-winning kick and at 573 pounds, why not? And just a personal favorite because it seemed like he memorized snap counts in a way that was like ingrained in his head. Hercules Mataafa for Wazoo. Great name. Like a, a 6 2, 245 defensive tackle who just sliced through every offensive line. I loved him. All right. Let's move to linebacker. I'm partial to, to two guys here. I'm ready. First off, a gentleman we actually had on the program. Mm hmm. Aaron Curry. Yeah. Formerly the fourth overall pick out of Wake Forest, was picked by the Seahawks in the 2009. NFL draft was a big deal coming out of college. Didn't really live up to the hype. Right. But we had him on the program and I was always partial to him. The one thing I remember, you could probably go back and find the show if it hasn't been deleted. When we talked to him, we we said to him, what are you going to do with your money? What are you going to do with your, with your first paycheck? And he talked about how he wanted to buy, and I forget the breed, but some breed of dog that was very rare, might have been silver and had I think it was blue, a husky-ish something like had that. Had blue yeah. eyes Malumet. or silver eyes. Right. Something akin to that. So I hope he got his puppy. And I hope he's doing well. May not have worked out in the pro game, but was an absolute force at Wake Forest. He was a total force. And then the other one here is Joe Schmidt. Oh, I love that call. Joe Schmidt to me. Feels like one of the ultimates of this list. Joe Schmidt, former Notre Dame linebacker, undersized, walk on, had a lot of feel good qualities to him and his play. Five foot nothing, hundred and nothing. Was very, very bright on the football field. Maybe not the most athletically sound, but certainly plugged the hole up the middle and was limited, but very effective in his own right. Was he there the same time as Jalen Smith? He was. Yeah, so that was like a nice dichotomy because Jalen Smith was everywhere. Jalen Smith was arguably the best linebacker in the country. And then you next to him, you have, what, what are we going to use? Gritty, Wes Welker type, yep, Joe yep, Schmidt. Yep. Um, no, that was a good, that was a, you know, Notre was, Dame recently has done really well with linebackers. It, it was a very good tandem. But what I will never forget about Joe Schmidt, and maybe it was because you could see the contrast between him and Jalen Smith on the field because they were playing on, on the same team, same side of the ball, every play right next to each other. Joe Schmidt is one of the only players that I can remember watching the game and listening to the commentators pretty much talk openly like he's not going to play in the NFL. <laughs> like, yeah, we he's good enough 
for this team, but like he's going to be going pro in something other than sports. Mm -hmm. And the degree to which the commentators were just open about this fact always blew me away. Is like, it, does Joe Schmidt find this disrespectful that they're talking about him like this? He's having a pretty good year. There's also a Joe Schmidt who played linebacker for Pitt in the like 50s. Uh, so there's that. So uh, uh, my linebacking crew is all over the place, but I love it. So I've got Scooby Wright, obviously. Good one. Good one. Who piled up tackles like he was paid a dollar a tackle like they would pay you for Nutria in Louisiana to help get you through the winter. Scooby was just everywhere and just piled it up, put up every stat, but was a Heisman finalist. So I feel a little bad putting him in as a, a sentimental favorite, but he absolutely was because he didn't do much. I think he was on an AAF squad. Um, Ray Maluga, who was a total blue chipper and had an NFL career and maybe still is in the NFL. I have no idea. But when he came in, I mean, the USC linebacking crew, I keep saying crew, but linebacking core, whatever, is one of the most talented when you look at like the the height of the Pete Carroll era with Brian Cushing and Keith Rivers, all these guys. And Ray Maluga, when he came in, you're like, I think he wants to kill somebody. And he was there. I, th- I want to say he overlapped with Vontez Perfect, but I'm not positive who was actually on my act- all-all team. But that huge hit against UCLA is one of five, six times where I was watching a game. You're like, what just happened? Is yeah. that guy all right? <laughs> is that guy's spleen in the 17th row? And I, he was just ridiculous to watch. And then my third guy is Kentrell Brothers, who this fits a very specific mold for me. He was at Mizzou 2015. And he had like 150 plus tackles. He was arguably the best player on a defense that had to do everything for this family. It was such a bad offense <laughs> that Mizzou's defense is there. Again, we've talked about great half teams. There is an argument to be made, and it would be the saddest argument to spend any more time on 2015 Mizzou, that that defense was the best defense on a terrible, terrible team that had to deal with a terrible offense. Kentrell Brothers. Holy Kentrell crap. Brothers. I think he's a backup in the NFL. I'm not sure, but he was everywhere. I loved him. We actually have some overlap. At what do we have? Defensive back position. I didn't know this. Oh, yeah, I saw this. We both have a Zach Sanchez. Zach Sanchez. Zach Sanchez had a run Sanchez. for Oklahoma, right? Yep. Where he was just incredible at finding the football, at picking off the football. Mm-hmm. Didn't amount to much as an NFL player. That's okay. But um, incredible run as a defensive back for the Sooners. Makes me feel sentimental for a time when Oklahoma occasionally stopped people throwing the ball. And Zach Sanchez was one of the reasons they did it. They had a couple good linebackers in there. They they struggled post-Venables, I would say. But Zach Sanchez, a lot of the time, was a bright spot. So we, we have that soft spot for Zach Sanchez. We had a ton of fun talking about Zach Sanchez, and especially doing that accent. But just looking over his college career, he had 15 interceptions in three years. Mm -hmm. which is incredible. Six and seven, his final two seasons at Oklahoma. They could use a lot more of that right now. Zach Zach Sanchez has any eligibility and wants to come back. And sometimes that means if you are throwing at a a corner more that maybe he's not as good as the guy on the opposite side of the field. And that's, it could be true. But if Zach Sanchez is pulling down picks, then he's doing what he's supposed to. So I like that. You have a couple other here's. Look, here's a couple others here. Yeah, I got crazy Carl Joseph, who's still Mm -hmm. actually, I think, in the league. But Carl Joseph from West Virginia, we called him crazy Carl because he was just like a torpedo coming down from the strong safety position. Uh, I've also got here the Darren Walls slash Gary Gray Mm -hmm. blended era at Notre Dame. There was some overlap there between the two. Darren Walls came in and was a very highly regarded cornerback prospect didn't quite amount to the hype once they got okay. him out there. Wasn't bad. Wasn't Gary Gray bad. But Darren Walls <laughs> was one of the first cornerbacks that I can remember in an era where Notre Dame needed cornerbacks where they actually went out and got one and he came in with mm-hmm. a lot of hype. Didn't 
quite pan out, but whatever. And then the Gary Gray thing, I put Gary Gray on this list because in the early part of our podcast, I made all sorts of hay making fun of Gary Gray. Okay. Not a very good cornerback, but still saw a ton of playing time because Notre Dame on the whole was not very good at cornerback either. And then it was, what, what year are we talking about? So this is like right as the podcast is starting up. Darren Walls. Yeah, this is 09, 10. Yeah. Finished his college career in 2010. And Gary Gray was shortly thereafter. He is currently the defensive coordinator at Baldwin High in Pittsburgh. Yep. I assume named after Jonathan Baldwin. <laughs> that would be weird. Um, who was the note? I liked a Notre Dame corner. This is weird to say out loud, but and it was like, 13, 14, 15, somewhere in there. Kavari Kavari Russell? Russell? Yeah, Yeah, he was good. He was good. They've gotten really good at corner. Um, My other corner, other than Zach Sanchez, is, I mean, how do you not love Cliff Harris and what he did on the field? Has had a rough go of it after, but uh, the rumor is, the story is, he showed up at Oregon, and when freshmen were introducing themselves to the team, he said, my name is Cliff Harris, and I'm here to lock shit down, and then just sat down. (laughs) And... Totally backed it up. I still claim he had that pick against Auburn in the national championship game that they ruled he was out of bounds. He had one of my just most viscerally enjoyable picks. It was that Tennessee game that, if you remember, there was lightning, a delay, and Matt Sims, bless his heart, decided to throw clear across his body across the field. (laughs) And Cliff Harris took it back for 80 and six. And it was just so wonderful. So, Cliff Harris, you were you were great, and I miss you. So, on the heels of talking about Zach Sanchez and drawing mm. drawing loose reference to our favorite John Miller fake Spanish accent, yes, I want to talk a little bit about Drew Alamon, the kicker, former kicker for LSU, who Vern Lundquist seemingly invented a fake French accent to describe <laughs> during CBS broadcasts back in the day. I, I, that sounds familiar. Drew Alemont. Alemont. Yeah. I'm surprised you didn't go with Brad Wing here, but, you know, that's too obvious. He's He was so good. Yeah. I mean, he's um, playing in the NFL now. And he's still in the NFL, but, you know, for a punter on a fake punt to uh, get an unsportsmanlike conduct penalty as he runs in a touchdown on a fake punt. Oh, it's wonderful. Um, I have Alex Henry, who was also excellent. This is yeah. not underrated. Nebraska? But... For Nebraska, I think he's still their all-time points leader. And I just, I still remember him. There's something about a kicker who doesn't just make field goals, but you get the announcer saying, that would have been good from 70. And he was putting deep field goals in 10 yards above the crossbar and just had an absolute boot and could not have enjoyed his career more. I just, yeah, I was jealous watching him in Nebraska. I'm going to read through this list of sentimental favorites. Yes. On my end, on your end. We've got Casual Dress, James Franklin, Tate Forcier, Joel Stave. I don't know if I had time to mention Riley Skinner. Great name. Yeah. Great name. Mikel Lashore, Fitzgerald Toussaint, Lake Seastrunk. My boy, Zach frickin' Zwinak. You forgot the top. You forgot two of the names on here. Oh, I, uh, for Roy Hallou back. Jr. Oh, yeah. And Ralph Bolden. Uh, Poor right. Ralph Bolden with his knees. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Aurelius Ben, Marvin McNutt, Josh Huff, Derek Rogers, and Jeremy Gallon. I had Jackson Jeffcoat, Aaron Curry, Joe Schmidt, Darren Walls, Gary Gray, Zach Sanchez, Sanchez. Crazy Carl Joseph, and Drew Elmo. And then on your side, we had Denard Robinson, Jimmy Clausen, T Magic, Taylor Martinez, Kadeem Carey, mm-hmm. David Wilson. James Rogers, Jabid, J- Jared Abraderis, AJ Jenkins, Kyle Long, every TCU undersized defensive uh, end, excuse me, Hercules Montaafa, Kentrell Brothers, Cliff Harris, Alex Henry, and Zach Sanchez Zach times Sanchez. two. Um, yes, all of these are correct. Um, I am quite excited. These are our sentimental favorites. And on part two, we're going to be doing our actual favorite excellent players at each position. And and we are going to try to make cases for why they are the, the deserving ones in our minds. So, for instance, like you have here uh, Tom Reese yeah. as your number All-time one quarterback. Best, right? And so, yeah. Should we 
I, I meant to do this. Should we be calling him Jim Clausen? I don't know. John Manziel? Chris McCaffrey? Oh, I'm, I'm previewing too much here. Um, I love this, Ty. I sincerely, sincerely did. Um, one of the things I just wanted to mention real quick before we go and, and preview next week is when you were talking about Crazy Carl Joseph, that there is something about having a a safety, it's usually a safety, but sometimes it's going to be a corner, who piles up ridiculous interception numbers and gets drafted like four rounds too high. And I couldn't pull the trigger on Raheem Moore, <laughs> <laughs> nor could I select David Amerson. But it's all I could think about when you were talking about Carl Joseph. Also, I was going to ask about tight end. Because I have an ends. answer, yeah. but I, it's putting you on the spot if you don't. So I'm going to give you my tight end who is automatic and another pre-fantasy things shoe in okay and that's nick o'leary nick o'leary for florida state yeah grandson of jack Jack nicholas Nicholas. yeah (laughs) Yeah. who could ever forget that would have been a fantasy things selection back in the day he was secretly one of if not the most dependable part of that all-time all-time i want to say it was 2013 florida state offense where anytime they'd get to third and seven, it would either be a screen or be like, oh, eight yard quick out to Nick O'Leary. Sure. Uh Uh-huh. Drive keeps going. And I respect that. If I go back and look at Notre Dame tight ends. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is going to be tough. Notre Dame has a long list of really good tight ends. Yeah. Getting back a while if you go back and look at it. But one that always comes to mind for me is Anthony Fasano. And that was slightly, I guess, before... (sighs) Our 2008 yeah, cutoff for this. He was maybe a year or two before that. But Anthony Fasano for me is the tight end that I think I have the most sentimental value. Who towards. is objectively the best Notre Dame tight end of the solid verbal era? Of the solid verbal era? Probably yeah. Kyle Rudolph. Rudolph. Okay. Yeah. It's prob- been a good run. It's been a really good run. Uh, Kyle Rudolph. Definitely in the mix there. You could probably throw Tyler Eifert in that equation as well. Mm-hmm. Though I don't think he was. I like Eifert a lot. As good John Carlson, another sleeper who played in the NFL for a while. If he's he might still be in the NFL. I don't know. Troy Nick. Troy Nicholas. Troy Nicholas, Troy Nicholas yeah. was in there. Troy Nicholas. Yeah. yeah. Um. God, there was a. I'm looking through. Oh, here. How about Ben Koyak? Ben Koyak. Yep. Sure. Um. Yeah, they went away from it. They've gone away from it a little bit recently. Alizé Jones and Alizé Mack. Um, man, this is a good lift. Durham Smythe? Durham Smythe. All right, we're just naming people now. My my pick for favorite Oregon tight end is David Paulson, for the record. Auburn, <laughs> Washington zone. All right, so here's the deal. Next week, we're going to go through our all-time, all-time team. Yes. And we'll I argue. Mean, 2008, yes. 2008, yeah. All-time, all-time within the span of doing the show. We'll go through a 2008 to present. In the meantime, though, please send us in your tweets, your emails at solidverbal.com. Wherever you can find us, please. Your comment. sentimental squad. Give us your sentimental squad, man. Let us know who you think about when you're talking college football. Maybe not the best guys, but your favorite sentimental favorites over the last, I don't know, decade or so. We're going to be back next week. We're going to do our all time SV team. And please do send in your suggestions for that as well. One more time, solidverbal at gmail.com. Hit us up on the website, on social media. And don't forget to check out that subreddit. It's reddit.com slash r slash solidverbal day. And you got anything else? I'm going to close with this, Ty. If you could select anybody on your all Ty sentimental team to have all 22, a team of only them, who are you selecting? <laughs> You want a team of Marvin McNutts? I think I'm going to go Lake Seastrunk. A team of Seastrunks? That's not bad. Yeah. All speed, baby. All speed, all the time. I'm going all Mata Afas. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. Well, for that guy over there, my good friend Dan Rubenstein for myself, Ty Hilderoy. We'll catch you all in a week. Thanks for listening. In the meantime, stay solid. Peace. Peace.